All right, folks, let's get started today. We're into our last two days of the evolution unit. Just a reminder, there is a test on Thursday this week. Um, and also a reminder, if you are interested in taking a mock AP exam, like a full length one, please fill out the Google form. The link is posted in the stream on Classroom. Um, please fill that out like before tomorrow so that I know who is going to come when to take that test. Um, I did change the form, so if you want to just take the multiple choice half or just take the FRQ half, you can before the form required you to pick both. Um, but I changed that this morning just because I thought of it. If you want to just do one half, if you can only come one day, pick the one that you expect to be more challenging for you, especially in terms of the time constraints. If you're worried about finishing the multiple choice in time, or the FRQ in time, pick whichever one you're more concerned about the time element, that's the one you should take as a timed exam. Um, so you can kind of see how it goes, or you can sign up for both, okay? But if you haven't done that yet, there's only eight or nine people who filled out that form, and I think there are more of you that wanted to do mock exams, so please get in there and tell me when you're gonna do that next week, and put it on your calendar so that you know to be here and don't forget um, about that. Any questions about that? All right, then take a second and talk about dinosaurs. Turn and talk to people next to you about um, what you know, because everybody has at least some knowledge of what happened to the dinosaurs. Talk about extinction and why it happened and how life on Earth changed after the dinosaur extinction. Turn and talk about that for a minute. Sorry. I know, I'm honestly, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm just I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just 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 I'm
the things that started to kind of take over a lot of those niches that used to be occupied by various dinosaur species were types of mammals, which eventually led, like we're basically living in an age that is dominated by mammals as the large animals on the planet, right? Before that was the age of reptiles like dinosaurs. And we see this kind of repeated pattern throughout the history of Earth. So if you don't have your notes out already, we're going to look at some notes today, and then we're also going to be doing a case study in a little bit that we're going to start. We're starting chapter 23, which is our last chapter related to evolution. We're not doing every detail of information that's in your book in chapter 23, but we're pulling out some of the big ideas. And really what chapter 23 is looking at is kind of the overall, the really big picture of how life on earth has changed over the history of the planet. And some of the big patterns that we see, a lot of which relate to extinction and speciation. We're also going to be connecting a lot of these big changes back to genetics and looking at the role that genetics plays and tying this into some of the things that we learned in the previous unit about genetics. So this is a really good ending to kind of tie together a lot of information from this unit and the previous unit into one nice, um, nice case study piece. Um, to wrap up this unit. First, though, we're going to talk a little bit about the process of speciation. Yesterday, we talked about how new species form and the mechanisms that can cause groups to become reproductively isolated so that they can evolve in different directions and become more and more different. One question scientists have asked and kind of debated over time is how quickly this process happens. And there were kind of two different schools of thought on this. Some people thought that it happened pretty gradually, a little bit at a time. Species diverged slowly and steadily over time. The example in these graphs is showing color change in mice. And here you can see as we move up this top graph, the mice gradually get lighter to the right and gradually get darker to the left. But it's kind of an incremental change little by little. Like each generation, they get a little bit darker or a little bit lighter. Um, and it's a pretty slow and steady progression. That school of thought is called gradualism, that this process is kind of slowly, gradually, constantly happening. The other school of thought came up with an idea that they called punctuated equilibria. So equilibrium is the idea of things staying constant and steady. Punctuated means that equilibrium is interrupted. So this idea says that new species or big changes happen fairly quickly, but then they stay the same for a period of time after that. So that graph would look a little more like this. You have the medium colored mouse here, and then there's a pretty sudden mutation, maybe one mutation that in one generation makes some mice much lighter and some mice much darker, but then they stay steady in those colors for a period of time. So instead of slowly getting a little darker, a little darker, a little darker. It's just all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of dark mice and within a generation or two it's a very quick change and then they stay dark for a period of time. Um, scientists have been gathering lots of evidence on this and both of these do occur but more and more examples that people are finding show that evolution is not always a slow process. We tend to think of this having to take like millions and millions of years, this really, really slow process of change, but that's not always true. Scientists have found lots of examples where they can measure the evolution, the, the change in allele frequency within a population in just a couple generations. And when you say a couple generations in bacteria, that's not very long at all. That's like a weekend, right? You can see evolution of bacterial populations really fast because they reproduce really fast. But even larger types of organisms, this all doesn't always take as long as we may have previously thought. Sometimes speciation can occur fairly rapidly. And throughout the history of Earth, 
Earth, it tends to happen kind of in big bursts where lots of new species form, and then they tend to stay kind of steady for a while. So throughout the history of the planet, like I said, we kind of see this pattern where lots of new species will form and then a bunch of them will go extinct. They're kind of the, these alternating things. We talked about this one at the end of the dinosaur age. There was the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. And then after that, there was the rise of the mammals. Lots more mammal species started to come and take over. That pattern has actually been um, repeated many times through the history of the planet. This is just the one that we are all most familiar with because dinosaurs are very popular and cool looking and most kids go through a dinosaur phase. But it's happened several times. For a while, the dominant creatures on Earth were soft-bodied creatures. And then the trilobites kind of came and took over. And then, what are those? Nautiloids. I don't even know exactly what those are. Took over. And then you had sea scorpions. Then you had fishes. And so at each period, at the end of each of these, there was a mass extinction, not of all, but of many of the species that had previously existed. And we're going to come back and look at that more in just a second. Some of those big changes have to do with other geological changes that have happened on the Earth. You're probably familiar with the idea of plate tectonics, that all the continents used to be all in one big, massive continent called Pangaea that slowly broke apart into Laurasia and Gondwana land, and they separated more into the continents we know today. Obviously, those massive movements affect the living things in those places as well, right? Um, there are a couple different ways that this movement could affect species. One is that it reshaped physical features. It created new oceans and new mountains. And so it literally built new habitats that hadn't existed before. And so that created new ecological niches where species could move and begin adapting to those new places and form new species that way. It also changed the climate. As these continents moved across the earth, they became warmer or cooler or wetter or drier, which also affected the natural selection that was happening in that area. And this allowed for really large scale allopatric speciation. What does allopatric speciation mean? Turn and talk to somebody next to you or look back in yesterday's notes. Allopatric speciation is when organisms are separated geographically, right? And so obviously if a huge ocean starts to open up between you and other members of your species, you're not going to be very likely to cross the ocean to reproduce with those on the other side anymore, right? So you're very much geographically separated on a large scale. And you've probably heard this type of evidence before that we find similar fossils like on the coast of South America and the coast of Africa that show us they were once connected, the same things lived there, but as the, those continents separated, natural selection happened differently on each continent and we end up with different species that live there today. So kind of really large scale allopatric speciation. So the combination of those um, geological changes and just the natural process of natural selection and extinction that happened has led to this kind of alternation of formation of lots of new species, and then lots of things go extinct. And then there's lots of new species, and then lots of them go extinct. And we can actually see that this graph um, shows the number of, not species, but of genera, which is the plural word of genus, which remember is the, the level of organization above a species. So it's a way to measure how many different types of species there were on the planet at any given time, of course, based on what we know from the fossil record. And you can see at the end of each major um, period in Earth's history, there are all these names, the Devonian, the Ordovician, the Permian, all those different periods of Earth's history. At the end of each one, there's a big dip in the number of species. So at the end of the Ordovician, there's this big, this right here 
is the extinction of a whole bunch of whatever the main living thing that was in most of the environments on Earth during the Ordovician was. Many of them were wiped out at that point in time, maybe because of geological movement, maybe because of something else. The causes can be varied. But the important pattern here is that after that extinction happened, it opened up all of these new ecological niches so a whole bunch more species could form. And you had a lot of adaptive radiation happening during that time. Remember, adaptive radiation we talked about a little bit with the lizards a couple weeks ago. Um, that's when groups of organisms kind of spread into a lot of newly opened ecological niches and begin to diverge and become different as they adapt to those different ecological niches. And so that's happened over and over. At the end of each geological period, there's a crash of mass extinction and then a whole bunch of new species form. And here the Cretaceous one, this is the extinction at the end of the dinosaur age. So that right there is the extinction of the dinosaurs. And you can see this one probably goes up higher because it's more recent, so we don't need to rely so much on fossil evidence. We can also look at the species that exist today. Um, but you can see there's kind of this massive burst of speciation after each major extinction because it basically just clears a lot of space and a lot of habitats for new species to form. Any questions just about that big overall pattern? through the history of Earth. We can also see that idea of adaptive radiation on a smaller scale. Like I said, we talked about that word first with the Caribbean anoles, as on each island, they kind of spread into the different niches within the habitats available. And then they all evolved separately to develop adaptations to that particular niche. Um, we can also see regional adaptive radiation happening in newly formed islands. Um, if you have a set of volcanic islands that's like just emerging from the ocean, there's all of these new niches where species can spread out and fill in those different places in the environment. Ice ages can also cause adaptive radiations to happen because an ice age will often kind of wipe out whatever species lived there before. Um, and as the glaciers recede after a few thousands of years, there's kind of a clean slate. There are all these new habitats that open up and new species can move in and colonize those areas. So this is kind of on the smaller scale, but this has happened over the entire planet over the course of Earth's history as well. Questions about kind of those big ideas. So the process of forming new species is something that's a little challenging to study um, because macro evolution sometimes does take quite a bit of time. But scientists have found some examples. Like we said, sometimes this happens fairly rapidly. And so they have found some specific examples that they can study of kind of how this happens. And especially what we're going to get into as we talk about speciation in this case study is some of the genetic mechanisms that allow for rapid development of new species. So our case study is going to focus on this little tiny Fish. It's called a stickleback. It's type of, it's like the size of a minnow, but they're called sticklebacks because they have those little pokey things on their back. Um, this one's called a three-spine stickleback for obvious reasons. Three-spine sticklebacks um, live in oceans, but they can also live in freshwater. They're different types. The map up at the top shows um, the extent of the last major ice age on the planet. The last ice age ended just over... I think it was about 12,000 years ago. Um, and at its fullest extent, the white at the top of the map here shows kind of how far south the ice covered. Um, and so the important thing here is I want you to notice that all of Alaska and all of Canada is pretty much solidly covered in ice, right? The reason this is important, this map is showing where sticklebacks can be found. And the ones that we're going to focus on in this case study are some populations of freshwater sticklebacks that live in Alaska and Canada. 
There are some really interesting differences in those species of sticklebacks compared to the ones in the ocean. Um, and the reason this is a really good example is since that area was all covered by glaciers, the lakes that these sticklebacks lived in or live in now were formed as the glaciers receded, as the glaciers kind of backed off and went away and the ice melted. So we know that this evolution, the differences we see between these freshwater sticklebacks and some of the marine ones must have evolved within about the last 12,000 years because that's as long as these lakes have existed. So that's a relatively short period of time compared to the entire history of the planet. And so we can look at kind of how these changes have happened within this relatively short period of geological time. As we go through this case study, I am going to give you a little bit of information and then there will be questions for you to answer. Um, and it'll kind of be a back and forth to what we call an interrupted case study. So I will talk through a slide or two, and then there'll be a question that you will discuss in a group and answer together. Um, I'm going to give you, we're going to take a minute just to kind of get groups and things set up here. And so I will give you the option. If you want to work with a partner on this, you only need to fill out one answer sheet for this activity. If you would like to fill out your own just because you want to, that's totally fine as well. Um, but right now I would like you to decide if you want to work with a partner and have somebody come up and grab one of these packets so that you have a place you can write your answers down. But like I said, you only need one per group. Okay, so get yourself set up with that. Kylie, do you just want to pick who you're going to work with? Um, I can, yeah. Okay. So I want to be either Daddy or Hannah's phone number. If one of them wants to work alone, I can work with the other one. But if they both want to work with someone, it doesn't really matter. Gabby or Hannah, were either of you planning to work alone? Okay. I think they're each working with a partner, but you can work with them as a group of three. That is okay with me. Okay. I'll just FaceTime Gabby then. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. And then she's going to stay on the meet too so she can hear what I'm saying. But then when we do, I just don't want to make her do the whole thing on her own. Oh, yeah. So when we do um, the discuss the questions parts, you three can just talk about it. And then one of you can just record the answers. Um, so then Kylie, you can ignore this post in classroom. I posted this as a homework thing um, just because I wasn't fully sure how it was going to work for people at home. But you do not need to fill out the doc on classroom unless you want to write out your own answers. They will record the answers that you guys discuss and they'll put your name on their sheet. Okay. 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 All right. Um, like I said, because this is kind of an interrupted case study, please do not work ahead on the questions. Um, I think all the questions are actually up here on my slide. So when we get to it, then you can answer it, but you need to see some of the diagrams and the information that I'm giving you um, before you can go ahead and answer those questions. Okay. So we are going to be looking here at first some of the variation that exists in these stickleback populations. Like I said, some of these live in the ocean and some of them live in freshwater. Most marine sticklebacks, the ones that live in the ocean, have two specific traits that we're going to be talking about here. They have what are called pelvic spines, which are in addition to the three little spikes on their back, they have a couple little spikes down at the bottom here and they stained them red. So I should draw it like this. Um, and body armor, which is kind of these hard scales that you see going down the sides of their body. They call that body armor. So those are the two traits that we're going to be talking about. The pictures that you see up here are preserved specimens where they treated them with a dye that like stains the bony hard structures. So that's why you see the weird colors. This is not the colors they would be in a lake. These are preserved specimens stained so that we can specifically see these structures. So the marine ones have both of those. The freshwater populations have lost both of those traits. So this one down here is a freshwater stickleback. It has no pelvic spines and no body armor. So it's missing both of those traits. So that's kind of the, um, the evolution that we're looking at is how did this loss of body armor and pelvic spines happen and why? And like I said, this is a good example because we know it has happened fairly quickly, fairly recently and fairly quickly in evolutionary time. 
because up until about 12,000 years ago, all of the lakes where these freshwater sticklebacks live were covered by glaciers. So there weren't sticklebacks there. So the first thing we're trying to figure out is why and how have these freshwater populations lost these two traits? Well, of course, the first thing that we think of is probably natural selection, right? That's usually what causes this type of change. If that's true, then that means that it has to fit Darwin's whole process of natural selection, which means those traits have to have a genetic basis, right? They have to be something that can be inherited. They have to affect the fish's fitness in some way. So having or not having has to give an advantage in the environments where they find themselves. And that would lead to the favored trait increasing in frequency. So in the ocean, it selects for the spines and the body armor. In freshwater, it selects against both those traits for whatever that reason may be. So we're going to start with the first thing on this list. First, we have to be sure that these are traits that are genetic and can be inherited. Because it's possible there's some environmental factor, maybe the chemistry of the water triggers something that causes some of the sticklebacks to have this trait and some of them not to, and it's not actually a change in the genetics. So the first thing you are gonna think about here is how could we test to see if these are actually traits that could be genetically inherited? What would we, would we do um, to actually do an experiment to test that? Think about it and write down your plan for experimentation um, on your answer sheet there. Okay. What were some of your ideas? What would you do to test whether these are inherited? Mm -hmm. um, we used to put the So you would breed the marine and the freshwater? No, like you put the Or you just put the marine ones into, into freshwater. freshwater. Okay, got it. What did you guys say? Instead of just breed both species with frog armor and pelvic spines together, and then the two were like non-human severe results of their offspring. Okay, what else? Any other ideas? I like the idea of putting, and I heard some other groups talking about it too, I like the idea of putting marine ones in fresh water to see if they disappear. I don't know if they tried that. They might have done a couple experiments to test this. If you thought of breeding together the marine and the freshwater sticklebacks, if you even talked about that, that's what these scientists decided to do to see if this was genetically inherited. You don't need to change your answer, but that's what they did. Um, even if this doesn't happen in nature, obviously a stickleback that lives in a lake and one that lives in an ocean are not likely to encounter each other. They can do it in a lab. They can collect eggs and sperm from the fish and combine them in a lab and do the breeding that way. So they artificially made this happen to see if this was a genetically or these were genetically inherited traits. And what they found, so this one over here on the left is the marine stickleback. So this is our parental generation. This is the marine stickleback that has pelvic spines and has body armor. And this is the freshwater that has no pelvic spines and no body armor. And all of the offspring in the F1 generation look like this. You can see they do have pelvic spines down here and they do have some body armor. So based on what you know about genetics, the first part of this case study is actually some genetics review too. What can you conclude about the alleles that control pelvic spines and body armor in these sticklebacks? Answer that next question on your sheet, please. Yeah. <laughs> 
Gabby, are you still talking to Kylie? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, sure. um, well, I'm just gonna be talking. While you're discussing this one, you may actually also answer question number three because that's kind of the next step. Based on what you think is happening with these genes, if they now took two fish out of that F1 generation and bred them together, what do you think they would see in the F2 generation? Does anybody need me to go back to that previous slide or are you okay? Those pictures. Good. Okay. If you know them, you can. You don't have to. Go on, or do you need another minute? Ready? Yes. Are you ready? So, what do you think is going on with these genes? How do you think these traits are inherited? More specifically, so they are genetic. We have kind of reached that conclusion. What else do you know about the genes for these traits? Which ones? body armor. So for having the traits, for showing that trait that's dominant, because all of the F1. So in that case, what would you expect that they got in the F2 generation? You would see, so what do you mean both? What it? Ryan's shaking his head. Teach us some genetics, Ryan. So let's let's back up. Let's back up. This is a good genetics review moment. So our original marine sticklebacks had both of those traits. So you're telling me they had the dominant genes, and our original parental 
freshwater fish had neither of the traits, so they had the recessive genes. Is that what you're saying? Which means what is the genotype for both of these traits in the F1 generation? So that's pelvic spines. What about body armor? So then if we cross two F1 organisms, this is more complicated than you want it to be. That's why you said 50-50, because that sounds easy. That's not what you get here. It is not even one to one to one to one. This is, however, a ratio that you should probably know because it just comes up a lot. So um, a true, this is a true dihybrid cross where both of the organisms are heterozygous for both traits. There are four possible gamete combinations here, right? So each parent could give two dominant alleles, dominant recessive, recessive dominant, or two recessive. Everybody okay with this? And that's true of both parents. So if we go through and fill it in, I'll fill it in for you, and then you get to figure out the ratio of the phenotypes that we should see here. Let me know if I'm doing any of these wrong because I'm doing this fast. Uh -huh. All right, figure out the ratio and add it to your previous answer. What would this F2, so the ones that are in the boxes, this is represents the F2 generation. What phenotypic ratio would you expect to see here? Yeah, a few. You end up with a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. So if you know that, you don't have to do this Punnett square and count every time if both parents are heterozygous for both traits. So the way that that works, to have both pelvic spines and body armor, they have to have at least one capital A and at least one capital B, right? So that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's the nine that would be dominant for both of these traits, right? So there are going to be nine of those. The ones that have pelvic spines but no body armor would be dominant for the A but recessive for the B. So that would be this one, this one, and this one. So there's three of those. The ones that are the reverse, they have no pelvic spines but they do have body armor would be these three. And you have just one down here that is recessive for both traits. Everybody follow that? 
As long as they're he both parents are heterozygous for both traits, you will always get the nine to three to three to one. Yep. All right, so after that good little genetics review right there, that is actually what the scientists found. They had nine fish, can you use a different color? Or nine out of, you know, the proportion or whatever, that had both traits. They had three that had body armor, but no pelvic spines. They had three that had pelvic spines, but no body armor. And one that had neither of these traits. So take a minute and summarize. Your next question asks you, based upon those results, to summarize the pattern of inheritance of these traits. How many genes control them? What's dominant? What's recessive? All that kind of stuff. Explain what just happened. All right, I'm going to start talking through the next part if you're still wrapping up that answer. That's okay. Do you need more time to work on that? Or can we start with that? We're good? Okay. All right, so what they found through those couple experiments was that each of these traits, pelvic spines and body armor, were controlled by one gene with two alleles, one that was dominant and one that was recessive. That was actually a lot simpler than they expected. They thought these big body structures would probably be the result of a few different genes interacting. So they were kind of surprised that it was as simple as it was. Um, but that made the next part of this a little bit easier because now they knew the genetic mechanism. So we know this is an inherited trait that natural selection could act on. So this could be the result of the process of evolution by natural selection. So the next thing to think about, we're going to focus in on the rest of this case study, specifically on the gene that builds the pelvic spine. So we're not going to worry too much about the body armor. We're going to focus on the pelvic spines and how those were lost. Um, so take just a minute. You don't need to write about this, but just talk to each other. How do genes work? How are genes expressed? And do all of the genes function in all of your cells? And if not, how does that work? Talk about what you remember there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
a little. So let's talk about the first part. How is a gene expressed? What is that phrase gene expression? What does that even mean? Yes. How do we get from a piece of DNA to a physical characteristic? Tell me more about that. All right, so we're talking about making proteins, which leads to traits. Amongst all your brains, it's all in there. So how do we make proteins? Transcription of the DNA into RNA. And then what do you call the second half that happens at the ribosome? Translation. Translation. We're putting a whole bunch of review in here because that's just good for you anyway. So transcription and translation is the process of gene expression. That's how we get from DNA to a physical trait that you can see or that affects how an organism works. Um, let's talk about that first step. If we've got this gene in the DNA, if transcription is going to happen, how does transcription start? I'll give you a hint. You modeled this at home with big, long strips of paper. It's not just a start codon. That's translation that looks for the AU gene. Um, RNA polymerase is part of it. Yes, that is the enzyme that builds messenger RNA. How does RNA polymerase know where to start? It's like the insert and the like There is a specific genetic sequence that we talked about. It's not a start codon. Yes, you remember that TATA that's part of the, the promoter region of the gene? Like I said, we're pulling it all back out of your brain. It's all in there. Um, at the beginning of most pieces of DNA, there's a promoter region that usually in eukaryotes contains that TATA sequence. And transcription factors, all, the other protein, all these other proteins need to bind there to help RNA polymerase get in position. And sometimes there are also other bits of DNA even further back that are called regulatory sequences that help that or inhibit that from happening. Kind of remember this? I know we're about done for today. It's all right. This is good review stuff. Those pieces are called regulatory DNA. So we're going to end with this for today. There's, we'll continue with these questions tomorrow, but this is going to be important as we keep going through. Just look at this diagram for one minute. On this, the black line represents the DNA. This purple bar represents the actual coding region. So this is where transcription would start. These shapes represent bits of the DNA that are the regulatory sequences that help transcription to begin. We're going to start with this diagram tomorrow because this will be really important to understanding the gene that controls pelvic spine development and figuring out how this works. Hang on to those packets. We will continue with sticklebacks tomorrow. And Kylie, you can sign off for today if you want to. We'll see you tomorrow.